What I'd like to focus on tonight for this 45th anniversary of TET is the legacy of those leaders and organizations that won the war against not one, but two imperialist powers and the ideology that guided them through a people's war that lasted for decades. The Vietnam struggle for liberation was not confined to the limits of Vietnam or even Southeast Asia. It connected to and inspired people's movements all over the world, reaching from Asia to Africa to the Middle East to Latin America and into the imperialist centers in Europe and North America. It is therefore an important part of the legacy of the working class and oppressed all over the world and must be preserved for future generations. The, the Vietnamese communists based themselves on Marxist theory, Lenin's analysis of imperialism and the national question, and employed a class analysis of Vietnam, the imperialist enemy, and internationalism throughout the war. Just as no analysis of the Cuban Revolution could be given without discussing the role of Fidel Castro in the revolution, any discussion of the, of the Vietnamese struggle must begin with Ho Chi Minh, who is universally recognized as the founding architect of the Vietnamese struggle. Ho was born in a small village on May in Vietnam on May 19, 1890. He was educated in Vietnamese, Chinese, and French. Ho's early life led him to the anti-colonial struggle against the French occupation of his country, which began in the 1850s. In 1911, following the anti-colonial revolution in China, Ho signed on to a French ship to leave Vietnam. He traveled widely as a seaman and got to see firsthand the conditions of the French colonial subject in Africa and the Middle East, which deeply affected his thinking. He lived in the U.S. for a while, we think around 1912 or 13, in Harlem and Hoboken, washing dishes and doing menial jobs. While in the U.S., he learned firsthand about lynching and the Ku Klux Klan, and later wrote a now famous essay ex exposing the horrors of racism in the U.S. He wrote in part, It is well known that the spread of capitalism and the discovery of the New World had as an immediate result the rebirth of slavery, which was for centuries a, scour a scourge for the Negroes and a bitter disgrace for humanity. What everyone does not perhaps know is that after 65 years of so-called emancipation, American Negroes still endure atrocious moral and material sufferings of which the most cruel and horrible is the custom of lynching. On the eve of World War I, Ho went to England to live where he took a keen interest in the Irish struggle against British rule. He also joined a clandestine organization of Asian expatriates in London called the Overseas Workers. By 1917, he had moved to France to join other Vietnamese patriots in advocating for the independence of their country. He became involved in the French Socialist Party and took on the name Nguyen I Quoc. He founded and wrote for a journal called, uh, in French, but called The Outcast, and advocated for the colonial peoples all over the world. At the close of World War I, the imperialist powers convened the, the Paris Conference, Peace Conference at Versailles to divide up the colonial plunder won in the war. Ho Chi Minh went to the conference to petition Woodrow Wilson, among the other imperialist powers, for self-determination for Vietnam, but he was unceremoniously shown the door. While the imperialists were carving up the world for colonial rule by Europe and the U.S., the Bolshevik Revolution was exposing the role of the imperialist powers in the colonial world and putting forward Lenin's theses on the right of oppressed nations to self-determination. This had a powerful influence on Ho Chi Minh, who described his conversion to communism in an essay called The Path That Led Me to Leninism.
He described how he followed the debates over whether to remain in the second international whose member parties had supported their own imperialist governments in the war or join the third international organized by the Bolsheviks. What I wanted to know most, he said, and this was precisely not debated in the meetings, was which international sides with the peoples of the colonial countries. I raised this question, the most important in my opinion. Some comrades answered, it was the third, not the second, and they gave me Lenin's thesis on the national and colonial questions. There were political terms difficult to understand in this thesis, but by dint of reading it again and again, finally I could grasp the main part of it. What emotion, enthusiasm, clear-sightedness, and confidence it instilled in me. I was overjoyed to tears. Though sitting alone in my room, I shouted out loud as if addressing a large crowd, dear martyrs, compatriots, this is what we need. This is the path to our liberation. Ho Chi Minh became a founding member of the French Communist Party and for the rest of his life kept the perspective of building solidarity between the oppressed colonial subjects of French imperialism with the working class of France. Ho spent a number of years in the Soviet Union and China during the 1920s, and in 1930 collaborated with other Vietnamese Marxist revolutionaries to found the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. It is instructive to read the 10-point program that Ho drew up for the party at the time. It included a call to overthrow French imperialism and Vietnamese feudalism, to confiscate the banks and other enterprises belonging to the imperialists, to put them under the control of a worker-peasant soldier government, to confiscate all the plantations and property belonging to the imperialists and the Vietnamese reactionaries, and distribute them to the poor peasants, to implement the eight-hour working day, provide universal education, and to re realize equality between man and woman. This was a revolutionary program to fundamentally change the property relations in society. It gave the Vietnamese people the political confidence, backed up by a strong centralized organization, to take up arms against the French and begin the long struggle for liberation. Once the party was formed and its program proclaimed, the struggle in Vietnam escalated. Throughout the 1930s, Ho was unable to return to Vietnam because he was being hunted by the French police. But he was the consummate organizer of the liberation fighters both inside and outside the country. He was arrested and imprisoned a number of times, including being imprisoned for two years by the Chiang Kai-shek forces in China. In but by 1941, Ho was finally able to establish a base in a cave at Pak Bo in the north of Vietnam, where he, along with Vo Nguyen Giap founded the League for the Independence of Vietnam, or Viet Minh, which carried out the struggle for independence against the French and then against the Japanese occupation of Vietnam during World War II. The Viet Minh was so popular in the anti-colonial struggle that within weeks of the defeat of, of the Japanese imperialist army, on September 2, 1945, the Viet Minh declared the formation and independence of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam with Ho Chi Minh at its head. In a speech to a huge crowd gathered in Hanoi for the Declaration of Independence, Ho Chi Minh indicted French imperialist rule, saying, They have built more prisons than schools. They have mercilessly slain our patriots. They have drowned our uprisings in rivers of blood. They have forced us to use opium and alcohol. In the field of economics, they have fleeced us to the backbone, impoverished our people, and devastated our land. They have robbed us of our rice fields, our mines, our forests, our raw materials. They have mercilessly exploited our workers. For these reasons, we, members of the provisional government of the 
Democratic Republic of Vietnam solemnly declared to the world that Vietnam has a right to be a free and independent country, and in fact, it is so already. I'm sorry. Within weeks of this declaration, however, the French imperialists with the military and financial backing of the U.S. began the campaign to reconquer Vietnam and opened up nine more years of bloody French colonial rule. However, the Vietnamese leaders had gained years of military training in China during the revolutionary struggle there and were prepared to fight guerrilla warfare against the invaders. In the meantime, thank you. The triumph of the Chinese Revolution in October 1949 gave the Vietnamese a strong ally to the North, and when a, within a few months, China as well as the Soviet Union had recognized the Vietnamese government. By February 1951, the leaders in Vietnam called a revolutionary congress to form the Vietnamese Workers' Party. Its program was to win independence and unify the nation, abolish the colonial regime, give land to the penitent, to the peasants and develop popular democracy as a basis for socialism. In the continuing fight against the French imperialists, General Vo Nguyen Giap was the most famous of the Vietnamese military leaders. He wrote what is now considered the authoritative work on guerrilla warfare entitled People's War, People's Army. He described how the French had to disperse their forces to occupy Vietnam, giving the guerrilla forces the opportunity to transform the imperialist rear into the liberation forces' front lines. In the early years, the Vietnamese fighters had almost no arms. The few arms they had were used to organize what were called armed propaganda units, because they knew that first the people had to know what they were fighting for and who the enemy was. This emphasis on political education as primary was characteristic of the Vietnamese struggle throughout the decades. The French were finally defeated in one of the greatest anti-colonial battles in human history at Dien Bien Phu, a heavily fortified stronghold. This was a heavily fortified stronghold of the French military in the northwest of Vietnam. It was considered impregnable. Vo Nguyen Giap, commander in chief of the Vietnam People's Army, directed the battlefield strategy. Tens of thousands of volunteers built hundreds of miles of roads, dug hundreds of miles of trenches, and some 200,000 volunteers hauled artillery and ammunition, as well as food and fuel, up and down mountains, using thousands of bicycles, ox carts, and other crude vehicles to prepare to bombard this French stronghold. After 55 days and nights of continuous fighting, on May 7, 1954, the Vietnamese army completely destroyed the Dien Bien Phu fortified camp. After hoisting a white flag, the entire French command surrendered, along with over 11,000 troops. A Vietnamese historian described this battle this way, the Dien Bien Phu victory was the greatest victory of our army and people in the protracted resistance against the French colonialists and American interventionists. One of the greatest battles in the history of the oppressed people's struggles against the professional armies of the colonialists. The effects of this victory were felt around the world. It inspired the development of the Algerian liberation movement also suffering under French rule Within a few years, liberation movements spread across Africa, and the July 26 movement stormed the Moncada barracks in Cuba. <laughs> 
But in, but in Vietnam, the, interven the U.S. intervention had begun long before the French defeat. Washington and Wall Street were seeking to expand their empire in Asia, and even while they were fighting the Korean Revolution in a bloody war from 1950 to 1953. By some estimates, in 1954, the U.S. was already paying 80% of the cost of the French military expedition in Vietnam. Within months of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the French were forced to enter peace talks in Geneva and leave. However, the Vietnamese were denied in the Geneva Accords what they had won on the battlefield. Vietnam was divided into north and south. The independence of the DRV was recognized, but the elections that were supposed to be held in the South to reunify the country within two years were canceled by the U.S. Instead, Washington installed one puppet government after another in Saigon and determined to continue the occupation of the country, much as it had done in South Korea. Vietnam, a relatively small and underdeveloped country, was now forced to fight on for another 21 years against the Pentagon war machine, which threw over half a million U.S. troops into the slaughter. It's hard for the mind to fully comprehend how this was possible, yet it was done, and it's important to understand the decisive role that political class consciousness and strong organization on the part of the Vietnamese played in this historic victory. The NLF was fighting a people's war. This is why the U.S military carried out so many massacres of the civilian population. Having won the vast majority of the people over to the resistance, the NLF, in fact, was indistingu indistinguishable from the people. Thus, the U.S. and its puppet regime in Saigon engaged in one tactic after another to isolate the NLF from the general population. When it became clear that the rural population was feeding and sheltering the resistance fighters, the U.S. tried to herd people into strategic hamlets, which were nothing but concentration camps. They used chemical warfare, dropping Agent Orange to defoliate the jungle hideouts and destroy crops. When these tactics didn't work, relentless bombing of so-called free fire zones followed. A new book entitled Kill Anything That Moves just came out about the Vietnam War. It's based on recently released uh, Pentagon documents. It, that about says it all. Millions of people were driven off the land into urban areas, but this only spread the resistance. NLF's uh, sympathizers and spies were everywhere, as Andy kind of gave some of the, um, you know, some of the stories of the, uh, the Tet Offensive. After the war, it was revealed that the head of NLF intelligence in Saigon was a woman who had worked in the officers' club for the U.S. officers, gathering information as she waited on tables. In 1968, following the Tet Offensive, the U.S. finally was forced to agree to open up negotiations to end the war. In another dramatic first, the Vietnamese showed the world how seriously they took the role of women in the war effort, and they appointed Madame Nguyen Thi Binh as the head of the Paris Peace Delegation for the NLF. The appearance of this woman resistance fighter in France had an, in Paris had an electrifying effect on the anti-war and women's movements around the world. Madame Bin had been an activist in the Vietnamese communist movement since 1948 when she was 21. She was imprisoned by the French in Saigon between 51 and 53. During the war against the U.S., she became a member of the Central Committee of the NLF and vice chair of the South Vietnamese Women's Liberation Association. 
1969, she was appointed the foreign minister of the Provisional Revolutionary Government of South Vietnam and played a major role in the Paris peace negotiations, facing the numerous threats by then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to unleash nuclear weapons on Vietnam. She was a signatory to the pa Paris peace agreements that were signed on January 17, 1973. And after liberation was twice elected Vice President of the Republic, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. I'm going to try to summarize some of this. Um, while the Tet Offensive was a blow to the U.S. and their puppet forces, and exposed the uh, lies about the nature of the war. The Pentagon and Nixon administration were determined to continue the war. They decided to step up massive bombing of the North as well as Laos and Cambodia. Meanwhile, the anti-war movement and the anti-war sentiment among drafted GIs grew exponentially. Muhammad Ali refused to be inducted into the army, saying that the Viet Cong never called him racist names. <laughs> Martin Luther King made his famous speech against the war at Riverside Church, as Mumia um, talked about. The U.S. effort was clearly coming apart on both fronts. I want to skip now. Um, you know, uh, in, in, um, in their attempt to uh, draw down uh, to re draw down the war, Nixon and the U.S. generals were forced to declare the Vietnamization of the war. That is, withdraw their forces, but they stepped up the arming and the training of the puppet troops. Um, however, the 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 Vietnamese people's struggle, um, a as always, was prepared. In, well in advance and very well. Uh, the chief of staff of the Vietnam People's Army described how they prepared for the final battle which ended the war in 1975. What they did was, um, first they talked about the international situation uh, whether whether uh, the U.S. was likely to come back into the war. They analyzed the situation in the South and realized that the puppet governments were weakening, and they decided to launch an offensive in the spring, uh, let me see, in the spring of 1975. In under two months, the Saigon regime collapsed, and all of, South, of the South was liberated by April 30th, giving us unforgettable, unforgettable images of the South Vietnamese collaborators scurrying to the top of the U.S. Embassy to flee Saigon in U.S. helicopters. Saigon was soon to be renamed Ho Chi Minh City in a reunified Vietnam. Of course, we can't discuss with uh, Vietnam without saying that in the aftermath of the war, the U.S. never paid a cent of the reparations it was supposed to contribute to the rebuilding of the country. It only left a legacy of death and destru destruction with an estimated 13.5 million people killed, wounded, or made refugees. An estimated 40,000 Vietnamese have died since 1975 as a result of the unexploded bombs left on the land, and untold millions suffer from the effects of the chemical warfare that could affect the population for generations to come. These effects of the war, combined with the loss of aid from the socialist bloc when the USSR collapsed, and conflict with China following, excuse me, following the war, have all combined to make the process of rebuilding Vietnam even more difficult than anticipated. But that's the subject of a whole other discussion. Perhaps the slogan that best summarized the legacy of the Vietnamese liberation struggle was raised by the Black Panther Party when they said 
The power of the people is greater than the man's technology. But the power of the people had to be organized. The Vietnamese people who began their war of liberation with only bows and arrows were organized by communist revolutionaries into the most determined and anti-imperialist fighting force ever seen. This is how they defeated the most powerful military on earth. Ho Chi Minh and his comrades were not only wise in military tactics, but they knew how to reach out to every progressive layer of Vietnamese society. From religious groups to minority peoples to students, intellectuals, workers, and peasants, to form unity in the struggle. And beyond that, they knew how to reach out to workers and oppressed peoples around the world to win allies and strengthen their fight. Ho Chi Minh did not live to see the final victory in 1975. He died in 1969, but he was confident in the outcome. I urge comrades to read the last testament that he wrote in May of 1969. It's, it's on the yellow sheet in the back. It's a remarkable document, and I'll just read a very short excerpt. Even though our people struggle against U.S. aggression for national salvation, may have to go through many more hardships and sacrifices, we are bound to win total victory. This is a certainty. My ultimate wish is that our entire party and people closely joining their efforts will build a peaceful, reunified, independent, democratic, and prosperous Vietnam and make a worthy contribution to the world revolution. And indeed they did. Long live the example of the Vietnamese Revolution. Thank you.